Be here now. Just be here now. We need some kind of a sacred space, a place that's held as a container for our death and rebirth, for our inner initiation. Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. Here, the topic of the talk was on refuge, on the refuges which are part of Buddhist tradition and practice, and how one could understand them in terms of finding a refuge in oneself. And tonight, I suppose what would be fitting would be to talk <clears throat> in part about independence, since it's going to be the 4th of July. <laughs> I did that last year, actually. I gave a talk on, on real independence, which wasn't what kind of beer you could buy or whether you bought American or foreign cars or something like that, but the spirit of independence I inwardly. However, I'm going to do something that's peripherally peripherally related to that this evening, if I may. I'm in the process of writing a book, a new book, for a Bantam publications uh, called Perils and Pitfalls of the Spiritual Path, um, mostly telling my own story, needless to say, and uh, the other gurus that I have known, um, not to speak of their disciples. And one of the chapters that's needed for this book that I've begun to reflect on is on true gurus and false gurus, if there is such a thing, either way. So I'd like to speak about the relationship to teachers and gurus tonight a bit, and in the context of doing a spiritual practice. Start by reading part of a 15-page meditation that was written by Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche in 1968 in a cave in Bhutan just after he had escaped from Tibet. He wrote, This is the darkest hour of the dark ages in which disease, famine, and warfare rage like the fierce north wind. The Buddha's teaching has waned in strength the various schools of the Sangha are fighting amongst one another with sectarian bitterness. And although the t Dharma teachings have been perfectly expounded and there are many reliable teachings since the Buddha, yet the students pursue intellectual speculations. The sacred teachings have strayed into cults and the yogis are losing the insight of meditation. On the whole, no one acts according to the highest code of discipline, justice, meditation, and wisdom. The jewel-like teachings of insight fade, and the Buddha's awakening is used for political purposes or merely to draw people together socially. As a result, the blessings of spiritual energy are being lost. Even those with great devotion begin to lose heart. If the Buddhas of the three times and the great teachers were to comment, they would surely express their disappointment. So to enable us to ask for help and renew our strength, I have written this course of practice for the embodiment or the awakening of the spirit. And then he goes on with a whole supplication of, of the masters and teachers, and primarily of oneself, asking that we find in ourselves that which is true in our spiritual life. That's pretty intense, isn't it? And yet there's, at least for me as someone who's been around the spiritual circuit for a while, there's more than a ring of truth in it. There is sectarianism. It's not just in Buddhism, but in any major religion. And then all the minor religions thrown in. And there are cults of all kinds. And um, the story, some of them are, are fantastic and, 
and as long as you're not involved in them, really kind of amazing the, the, what happened with Rajneesh Puram and all of the stories that came out of that. But particularly being in the trade or the business, I've heard more stories about swamis and lamas and Zen masters and mamas and everybody in between. Um, and it's not just sex and drugs and rock and roll, but it's also guns and uh, deep paranoia and spies and Jonestown and the things that you see happening to TV evangelists. And whole groups of people who are profoundly misled Now, there's that side of it, and most everyone who's got their eyes even a little bit propped open has noticed that something like that has been happening, um, and maybe it always happens with religion uh, worldwide, but it certainly happens in our time. On the other side, in many great traditions of practice, Tibetan, Hindu, Christian in some ways, Buddhist, one is asked to surrender. One is asked to enter into some compact of faith or trust with a teacher or a way of practice or a system, to surrender whether it's to Jesus or Allah or the practices of the Buddha. What do you do, though, when you look and the teacher is a rascal or an embodiment of crazy wisdom or worse, maybe just the crazy part without the wisdom? <laughs> So I want to speak about it. It may not be so relevant to some of you, but for others I suspect it is. And to bring it into consciousness in much the same way that the talk I did a couple of months ago about money was really an attempt to raise into the, the light of our attention, our relationship to spiritual teachings in these areas. Now, one of the most important things to understand about relations to teachers is transference. This is a psychological term. What it means is that you transfer onto some figure, a man or a woman, you transfer onto them without knowing it generally, the attributes of someone in your past, usually your parents. So that when you get into a relationship with a authority figure of some kind, you start to see them not just as they are, but either as your parents were or as you hoped that they would be. And you become afraid that they'll judge you the way your parents did or you look for what you didn't get from your parents and so forth. It's unconscious and it's a very powerful process. It's the process, another way to put it, the process of projection, of taking some ideal or some image negative or positive within us and putting on putting that on to another person so people project a lot onto teachers and the best image is it's like falling in love when you've fallen in love which one of my teachers called falling down the well when you do that thing which is a very interesting thing to do periodically you become blinded and what you see is mostly what you want to see. I'm sure you've all had that experience probably a number of times. We do it especially with spiritual teachers because we so deeply want something to be perfect in this imperfect world. There's got to be some place where there's perfect justice or perfect goodness. And we long for that so deeply that we hope we can actually see it in another person. We really long for it in ourselves. And then unfortunately what happens is when lots of students start seeing a teacher as perfect and the teacher might have some of those feelings about themselves, they really start to believe it. Oh, it must be so. Everyone thinks so. I guess I am. It's so easy to imagine what another person is like, especially in the spiritual arena. There's a story of Mullah Nasruddin. Let me see if I can find this one. Here we are. Nasruddin was wandering in a graveyard and stumbled and fell into an old grave. Beginning to visualize how it would feel if he were dead, he heard a noise. 
It flashed into his mind that the angel of reckoning was coming for him, although it was only a camel caravan passing by. The mullah jumped up, fell over a wall, stampeding several camels. The camel tears ran after him and beat him with sticks. He ran home in a rather distressed state. His wife asked him what the matter was and why he was late. I've been dead, said mullah. Interested in spite of herself, she asked him what it was like. He said, not bad at all unless you disturb the camels, then they beat you. We have this amazing capacity to take situations and imagine them to be different than they are. Have you noticed that in your life? In, in some way, that's what spiritual practice is about, is simply starting to wake up and see how things actually are in front of us rather than what we imagine. Now, let, let's ask, at least it seems to me, that we need to ask a series of questions if we look at this issue of relations to teachers. The first one is, do we need teachers? Do we need spiritual teachers? And I'll give you my answers, and you can see if your answers match or not. Maybe mine are wrong. You can try it out. I think we need them desperately. Because we're unconscious, as Nasruddin was in that story, in so many ways, that we need some place of dialogue, some reference outside of our own ego system, outside of ourself. Remember the poem from Kabir where he says, I decided to be a renunciate, so I got a robe, but then one day I noticed what beautiful cloth it was made of. So I switched it for burlap, but then I noticed that I threw it elegantly over my left shoulder. <laughs> so I work with my anger. No, I pulled back my sexual longings, he said, and then I got angry a lot. And I got rid of my anger, and now I'm proud of myself. <laughs> and he goes on for several paragraphs like that. It's what Chogyam Trimpa Rinpoche called spiritual materialism, that somehow our ego or our sense of ourself that needs to feel that we're important and, and significant and wise or whatever image that we need to compensate for how small we really feel inside, claims into its territory our spiritual life, almost when without our looking. We're not even noticing, and all of a sudden we gobble that up and become a spiritual person in some facet or fashion or other. So we need teachers in one very important way as a reference outside our own system, outside ourselves. Another way to see it is that we need teachers to create a sacred space or to hold the space of some initiation. Because to transform ourselves in some deep way, we have to enter in a process where part of us dies. True spiritual life includes a death as well as a rebirth. And it's very hard to do just out on the street, although it will happen sometimes if you get mugged or something like that in the right circumstance and see it with the right spiritual eye, all of a sudden something may awaken. But generally, that's not where one should go looking for it. We need some kind of a sacred space, a place that's held as a, as a container for our death and rebirth, for our inner initiation. And part of the role of a teacher is to have gone through that themselves and understand and be unafraid of the darkness or the pain or the strange phenomena or the visions or the dissolving or the dying or all those kinds of side effects that happen as one goes through a spiritual life. All right, even if we accept that we need a teacher, if we do, that we need something outside ourselves, what kind of relationship is best? In Buddhist practice, there's a wide range. There are teachers in Thailand or Burma, India, where I practice, who are very much the guru. You surrender to them, you bow, you do whatever they say, you become their disciple, and you give up your whole sense of yourself, and they kind of direct your life. 
And in doing so, if they're good, hopefully, you find some new place in yourself which is reborn, which isn't so centered on what I want and how I like it to be in one's own small ego. And then somewhere in the middle, there's a kind of teacher that the Buddha referred himself to himself as at times. The word is Kalyana Mitra, which means spiritual friend. One of the great masters that I spent time with wouldn't let you bow to him. He said, come and sit next to me. Just sit on the bench and let's just talk about our spiritual life together. I'm not going to put myself above you. What our relationship is, is as good friends who really want to speak the truth and remind each other of what is true. And then the farthest on that scale from guru to spiritual friend or advisor is from the Taoist tradition where less is more and where one has a teacher not in the role of a teacher, but simply by some inspiration, as it says. The Taoist teacher knows about letting the world alone and not interfering. I don't know about running things, letting things alone so that people will not blow their nature out of shape, not interfering so that men or women will not be changed into something they are not. If you train yourself, you can only get in trouble. You train your eye and your vision lusts after color. You train your ear and you long for delightful sounds. You delight in doing good and your natural kindness gets blown out of shape. The wise man or woman then, when they must govern, knows how to do nothing. Letting things alone, they rest in original nature. In the silence, their voice will be like thunder, though their movements invisible, like those of a spirit, the powers of heaven go with them every step of the way. So there's this range, and you'll find it in your spiritual life, and as you look around, from great surrender to teachers, to those who are more a spiritual friend, to those whose teaching is really their being, without any form. There are a hundred thousand ways to teach, as many as there are people. And in fact, everyone in our life in some, in some degree or other is our teacher. Another question then I'll raise. Do we need to surrender? Yes. Very simple. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yes. Question this, by the way. See if it's true or not in yourself. See if you agree. The ego, or the small sense of ourself, longs, the deeper part of ourself, even more than that, we long for something greater, some intimacy that's beyond just our ideas of things, some opening that takes us out of the shell of this limited self. And in some ways, what draws people so deeply to spiritual life is this inner longing of the heart. The prophet says, I come before dawn to drag you off. It's amazing and funny that you have to be pulled away from being tortured, pulled out into the spring garden. But that's the way it is. Almost everyone must be bound and dragged here. Only a few come on their own. Children have to be made to go to school at first. Then some of them begin to like it if it's wonderful. They run to school and expand with learning. Later, they receive money because of something they learned at school. They get really excited. They stay up all night as watchful and alive as thieves. There are two types on the path. Those who come against their will, the blindly religious people, and those who obey out of love. The former have ulterior motives. They want the midwife near because she gives them milk. The others love the beauty of the nurse. Both are drawn from the source. Any moving is from the mover. Any love from the true beloved. This and we are one. So some people have to be pulled from being tortured. Almost everyone bound and get dragged here. Only a few come on their own. Surrender is critical in spiritual practice. Surrender to a way, 
to a discipline, to a path, to a particular practice. I've almost never met someone who did it on their own, without a teacher and without a path. I've, I've met, I'm teaching retreats, probably 10,000 yogis. And often in our interview forms, people will write down, what kind of practice do you do? And they say, well, I've done meditation on my own for years. And almost never have I met someone who wrote that down or in my travels in Asia and so forth. Very, very rarely where there was a great spiritual depth to them. More often it was someone who did it a bit and learned some things and kind of had an interesting time, but there wasn't some deep transformation that took place. That requires a surrender, and generally it, we need help. It's too hard or too scary. The help can be from a teacher or it can be from a practice or a discipline or a way that we give ourselves to enough that something new gets born. If you were to sit and every time you sat and got a little bit uncomfortable, you said, all right, I'm going to get up. This isn't working. You know, or it's not doing so well today. I'm bored or my mind is wandering or restless or my body's in a little bit of pain. How deep would your sitting meditation go? Very shallow. Part of what makes it interesting and useful and ultimately profound is the fact that you have in sitting a discipline and you feel lonely and you feel sorrow and you feel anger and you feel bored and you feel happy. And then you face uh, the loss of someone that you loved and then you realize that you're getting older and you look at your dying and all these things come up and you just sit there with it. And you have this container or vehicle that requires you to surrender or die again and again into something that's true that you have to face. So we must surrender for spiritual practice. But then the question is to what? To a master? To a teacher? Ultimately, I would say that what we have to surrender to is the truth. If this is Independence Day or tomorrow is, what gives us independence is to see what is true for ourselves and accept that. All of spiritual practice is to see what's true and finally say yes. That's it. That's it. I don't want it to be this way. I hate this way. This is the way it is. I don't like that. Well, this is the way it is. I've been doing some prostrations, which are a Buddhist practice. And part of what you do in that is you visualize the Buddha and all the teachers of the great lineages and everybody else that inspires you who are all one kind of form of consciousness, awakened consciousness. And you go from standing up to flat out on the floor and back up again a hundred thousand times. And the spirit of it is to see what is the highest in yourself or in the world and then try to let your consciousness become one with that. Surrender to what is true, not to the practice, not to the teacher. Those are the vehicles. The raft is not the shore, but ultimately surrender to what is right in front of us. Ramana Maharshi said that there are two ways to enlightenment. One is through self-inquiry to see, to discover who we are, which is nothing or everything, depending on your mood. The other is surrender, letting go, not my will, but thine. And they're actually the same practice in different languages. Now, it's not the, it's not the path. It's not the vehicle. Some people get confused. My way of sitting or dancing or whatever is my practice. And those are the vehicles to an inner freedom. As one Buddhist poet put it, greater vehicle, lesser vehicle, all vehicles will be towed at owner's expense. <laughs> it's surrender to what's right in front of us. The Eightfold Path, Ajahn Chah says, see if I can find it here. He says the true Eightfold Path, it's usually taught as right speech and right action and so forth. But the true Eightfold Path is right here. Two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, a tongue, and a body. And our consciousness that awakes to what is here is that which walks the path. 
It's that simple. When the Buddha walked to a village at one point in his wandering, who had had, it's a, it's a bit like Marin County, I suppose. They had had yogis and lamas and swamis and everybody coming through in, you know, hordes. And the village, the Buddha came and they said, well, you're just the next one in a long line. Who should we believe? It was the Kalamas, the village of the Kalamas. We've had all these people giving us their spiritual opinions. And he got up and gave a very famous talk in which he said, don't believe any of them. Don't believe the teachers. Don't believe the texts. Don't believe something because it's ancient. There are ancient wonderful things and there are ancient mistakes. <laughs> Don't believe it because everyone else is doing it. You've made that mistake before. Don't believe it because no one else is doing it. But upon your own reflection in your heart and in your life, look to see if it leads to entanglement, if it leads to conflict, if it leads to suffering, if it leads to attachment, abandon it. And if this practice, this way, this understanding leads to kindness, if it leads to freedom from entanglement, if it leads to an opening of the heart, if it leads to clarity, if it leads to wisdom, then continue to do it and do it more. might have been the best thing he ever said. That's extraordinary and very rare. Now, there are danger signs for one to be aware of in the cult business. And a good friend of mine, Dan Goldman, who's the psychology writer and science editor for the New York Times, he had a, he had a he's written about this quite a bit. He recently had an article on, on common delusions in American life. Um, and delusions of grandeur and romantic delusions were at the head of the list. He said almost everyone has these kind. But the danger signs, you can ask yourself in this practice or whatever circumstances you find, are they asking for your money? And that's all. And they want you for your money. Are they asking for your body? Are you asked to break your own sense of ethical conduct or integrity? Are there secrets? Is there blind faith you're supposed to believe without being able to see for yourself? Are there dual standards where everybody's supposed to do something except the guru and a few people around them who can do it a different way? Are you not allowed to hang out with your old friends? Is it humorless? That's a good sign. Do you feel dependent? You need it. Addicted. Is there a confusion between power and wisdom or kindness? Because I'll tell you, this is just an aside, and maybe some night I'll do this whole talk on the relationship of power, knowledge, and wisdom. Wisdom has nothing to do with power. I know some very powerful people, generals and so forth, like who have no wisdom at all. <laughs> Or people with psychic powers who can do all kinds of them. And they're, they're yogis and people who can do amazing things with their bodies and minds. And they be, may be absolute asses you know, or cruel, powerful and cruel. Power is it's a kind of neutral thing. It can be associated with greed, with selfishness, with ego, with uh, aggression. Or it can be associated with wisdom. I also know some wise people who have no power at all. In fact, Part of their wisdom is this tremendous sense of emptiness. They possess nothing. They try to be nothing. And when you're with them, all you feel is this beautiful sense of peace that's their being. It's an incredible kind of power because it's unshakable. Nothing bothers them at all, very deeply in their heart. So power is really different than wisdom. Secrets, dual standards, people caught up in power. Does the quality give you a sense of being among those who have been born again? A couple of remarks on religion. Mark Twain, religion consists of a set of things which the average person thinks they believe and wishes was true. 
And then William James. Religion is a monumental chapter in the history of human egotism. (laughs) Pretty amazing, huh? The born-again energy. You have to be incredibly respectful of the power that gets generated in spiritual scenes. It's very intoxicating. And not only do people who participate become intoxicated, but the teachers themselves become intoxicated by their vision or their view or their powers. You get powers. Powers aren't such a big deal to be intuitive so you're a bit psychic. It's not. All you have to do is get quiet. Half the people in the room would be psychic. It's true. Channeling isn't so hard. People did it with Ouija boards in their living room. It's not that difficult. It's true. But there comes with this this sense of fascination or intoxication. And then fanaticism. The energy. We have the real way, Allah, or Jesus, or Buddha. This kind of practice. This Buddhist practice is better than that kind. You find it all, a lot in the Buddhist countries, too. Again, it's that quality of being in love. I'm so in love. This person or this teacher or this way is so right that nothing else could be right. I mean, I just want you to come and meet them and hear them and understand like I do how wonderful they are. Be real suspicious. That's all I can say. Or the sense that only this group is to be saved. Here there are five billion people on the earth and only those who are the followers of Baba, Dada, Mama, whoever it is, they will be saved and nobody else. The level of denial that can take place in these systems is powerful. Someone just gave me this cartoon as the talk started. It's these two old guys sitting on a park bench reading the paper. One says, this poll says that as you get older, you get happier. And the other guy says, it's amazing what a little memory loss can do for you. (laughs) The level of denial. We're wise, we're saved. We have it and nobody else has it. Never believe that because it's never, never, never true. It would be a sad thing if that were true. It would mean that it wasn't in every human heart. It would mean somebody could possess it. And the Buddha, when you praise the Buddha in those chants that I sometimes do, one of the praises for the Buddha and the Dharma is that it's open-handed, inviting anyone to test for themselves. Somebody asked that Ramana Maharshi, again, was a wonderful Indian saint. They were, lo- they were having to leave and they were feeling the great loss of leaving the community and then Ramana Maharshi was old and he was getting sick and they were afraid he was going to die and leave them. There was this whole thing about loss, this big dialogue. And he looked back. He had no trouble with people leaving or coming or himself dying. He said, where could I go? Where could I go? You, You miss the point. It's not this body at all. This is from the Persian woman, Saint Rabia. One day Rabia was sick, and so her holy friends came to visit her and sat by her bedside and began putting down all the things of the world to show how holy they were. You must be pretty interested in this world, she said, otherwise you wouldn't talk about it so much. Whoever breaks the merchandise has to have bought it first. So these are the things to listen for. Secrets, dual standards. Things that don't fit your own sense of justice or ethical conduct. A group consciousness that says we are in and those others are out. We're saved and the rest of the world is not. We're wise and they're fools. Now, it's tricky because there's a certain skillful means that some teachers use where they say this way is the best way. And once in a while, they know that it's not true, but it's so damn hard that if they would said to you, you know, there are a lot of good ways. This is one among many. When you hit the really hard part, you'd say, well, where's the other way? This one's too difficult. 
So there's a way in which teachers will put out, and I do it as well, this is really a good way. If you do it, you will learn, you will transform, you will face the things that need to be faced and die to old things and new will be reborn. So it can be skillful as well. And you have to listen, not with your mind, but with your heart. You have to listen in some inner way to understand. You have to have a sense. There's a monk who is a friend of mine and a teacher, actually Ajahn Sumedho, some of you may know, who was very much involved as an abbot of, with uh, all the f- traditional forms of Buddhism. And every time people come to see him, they bow. He gets th- thousands of people bowing to him every day. And what's beautiful to watch, he's a pretty ordinary fellow, and people will bow, and it's like the boughs just kind of run off him like water on a, on a green leaf. They don't stick. There's not a sense that he turns away and says, oh, no, don't bow to me. There isn't that kind of aversion to it. He just sits there, and you bow, and there's some way that he knows that what's being honored is not him, but something that's greater. You can listen for that in another And you can certainly listen for it in yourself. In a sense, what you need to learn, what we all need to learn, is to respect this great duality of perfection that can come in the human heart and our humanness, that they come together, that every single teacher is also human in whatever form they are. Now, I had a teacher I went to study with this Burmese master, after being with Ajahn Chah. And Ajahn Chah was in many ways the model guru. He was gracious and he was funny and he was very insightful and he could be stern, and he could be loving. And he, he lived in an impeccable way. He lived what he taught. And, you know, there were problems with him, but basically he was quite, quite uh, admirable and extraordinary. I left him at some point and went to study in this Burmese monastery because they did more intensive practice, and I wanted to do it as intense as you got, to do this year-long retreat in a little room where I didn't leave for a year, and I just sat and walked for 20 hours a day. You'd sit an hour and walk an hour, get your meals once in the morning, one bowl full of food, and other than that, see or speak to no one except the teacher 15 minutes every two days to tell them what was going on. So I said, all right, I'm going to really do this. And being a Westerner the only Western monk at this place when I went, he gave me a fancy cottage. It was really quite nice. Uh, a one-room cottage up on stilts, so I didn't even have to go down. Um, little kind of toilet in the corner, and then just this one room that I lived in. Unfortunately, it was right, two co- right near his, two cottages away. So that as I practiced, I would sit, and then I'd do my walking meditation, and he would be out greeting people. And he was this old Burmese guy who smoked Burmese cigars and who was a slob and um, a real grouch, a real kind of grouchy old fellow, you know. And he had this little flower garden that he'd work on, and then the dogs would come over, and he'd start throwing rocks and yelling at them. And then he'd spend the whole morning kind of with his feet up, reading the paper and belching, and then the whole afternoon talking with the loveliest nuns. He'd have them come over, and he'd just spend all his time with the, with the, with the beautiful young nuns. He was like 60 or 70 or so at the time. And so I'd be sitting in meditation and doing this practice. And then I got up and it's time to do walking meditation in my room. And I'd look out the window and there he was belching or kind of hanging out with the ladies, which monks aren't supposed to do. And I'd shake my head and I'd say, no, come on, this is just not the right teacher for me. And then I'd go back and I'd sit and the practice would start getting a little, I'd get more concentrated and deeper. And then I'd get up and I'd walk and I'd look out the window and he'd be throwing rocks and yelling. (laughs) And I was in torment. It was awful. For two months, I was in conflict. I kept thinking, I'll go back to my other teacher. This practice is more intensive and I like this practice. But this guy, I'm not going to learn from this person. I don't want to be like him. His robes drag. He's a slob. And it took about two months of a lot of personal suffering for the obvious thing to come into my consciousness, which was that, in fact, he was quite a good meditation teacher. And I would see him every two days, and he'd ask what was happening with my breath and my posture and the energy in the body and concentration. And he was a very good guide for that. He'd done 
25,000 people before me, and he really knew how to do it. And that it was really possible to take what was good from him and not buy the whole package. I didn't have to imitate this man. And then I actually became rather affectionate. I think of him now with a great deal of affection. And I wouldn't want to be like him, thank God. But he he taught me some things, Uh, I'll say. (laughs) Now one of the, I've got a bit more to go on, so I guess I will tonight. One of the one of the people who has who has written some about this topic and learned that I've learned a great deal about from as well is Ramdas, who almost has made it a profession of getting himself into spiritual trouble, finally extricating himself and then publicly confessing about it to as many people as he can get to come and listen. <laughs> So he tells the story, most of you know, of that period where he studied with his teacher, Joya, who he met in New York. I remember I saw him a week after he met Joya. He came and he said, I met this amazing lady, this woman in Brooklyn who's got long fingernails and dresses just like a Brooklyn kind of um, middle class housewife, knows nothing about spirituality, but she's sitting in her basement in a trance talking to my guru who died last year. And I go down and he's telling me all these things that only he knew. And so he was, Ramdas was really astonished. And so they thus began a saga of about five years of all these people practicing with Joya and so forth. And in the end, it turned out to be mostly charlatanism. Not all, but primarily it was that. And the worst, I won't tell the worst, but (laughs) it got bad. I mean, uh, Dan Goldman, another man I mentioned who was the editor of Psychology Today. And prior to that, he was a professor of psychology at Harvard and now the, now an editor at the New York Times. He and Ramdas went with Joya to meet this Tibetan Lama at Kennedy Airport, and there was this whole intrigue about how this Lama had come, and this group was going to save the world. He was going to bring these secret teachings and stuff, all the cult stuff you could imagine. And they went in the room, and the lights were really low, and he was wrapped in this kind of... Uh, ochre robe and didn't speak and kind of gave them a silent darshan and they left and and Ramdas said to Dan, well, was he the genuine thing? Because Dan had traveled in Ladakh and those parts of India where there are a lot of Tibetan refugees. And he said, I think so. (laughs) And it was a guy, it was an actor actually that they hired who wrapped himself in in a bed sheet that was dyed gold. I mean, it was really hokey. But we so want to believe. There's a story of Mullah Nasruddin again at one point. He was going in the, in the old days. They had also kinds of fashion shows, if you will, where people would show off the latest garments. And he'd never gone to one before. So he went to this show of great Persian fashions. He went there and he was really upset and disappointed. He said, they show you all these beautiful women and then they try to sell you the clothes. <laughs> Now, let me see if I can take it to a deeper level before I end. It's getting pretty bad. For Americans in our culture, in our time, one of the biggest issues is how many people are wounded, how many broken hearts and wounded spirits there are from nuclear families and addiction and the the breakup of the the connection that we used to have in village cultures. And so people come to spiritual practice looking for family, looking for dad who they never had, or mom, the perfect mother, the perfect father, the lover that they never had. And we are so desperate that we see these characters on TV TV evangelists. We're so hungry for, for the father that people send in millions of dollars for, for anything, for somebody to tell us the truth. And there's this incredible hunger to belong because we're so atom, atomized and separated and ice, in our little cars and our little houses that the sense of belonging is so powerful. You get in a political cause and you fight for something or against something and it becomes the most thrilling time of your life because you're connected to other people. And one of the great problems that happens in spiritual life 
is that our dysfunctional families then become recreated in the spiritual scene. And we bring that longing and we bring that the dysfunction as well and uh, uh, all of our projection in, onto the guru and onto the teacher. And then it becomes incredibly scary to leave if you're involved in some spiritual practice and it's the first time in your adult life where you've really got this family again. It doesn't matter how bad it is. It probably isn't any worse than what you grew up in for many of us. It's impossible to think of leaving because at least people know you and you're intimate and you have this community and this family. It's like abused children, you know, when, when children who are even profoundly abused are taken away from their families and ask what they want. Do they want to go into a foster home or do they want to go back to their parents? You know what they always say? They want to go back home. They want to go back home because the feeling of belonging, that's this longing I was t started to talk about, is so important to us to not be abandoned, to not be alone. And so you can get spiritual centers which are just one giant dysfunctional family. So what do we do with this? Suppose you're involved in some practice and you have a hunch that something isn't quite right. You know? Or suppose you hear, or maybe you don't hear, but there's some intuition, things aren't quite right and you really want to look at it. Ask your friends and listen to them and not your friends who are involved in it. So I come on Monday nights. <laughs> And it's pretty weird. What do you think? <laughs> or ask yourself the question, am I becoming obnoxious to other people? I mean, that's it. <laughs> Listen, pay attention to it. Question. Now, if you do get involved, or if you have in such ways of practice, there's no question that there's a lot of suffering that can come from it. But that's part of the game, part of spiritual practice. I and mean, life has suffering as a part of it. And no matter what practice you do, you will have to face suffering. That's really what practice is about in some ways, to face suffering and learn something with your heart. And so if you're involved in a spiritual practice where you become disillusioned, where the teacher gets off base, or where they get paranoid or grandiose or all these kinds of things, your heart will be broken. And it's worse for most people than, than the worst breakup of your love relationship. Because you trust and you give yourself in that family often so deeply. But in some way, even that delusionment is a part of the path. Although healing from it can take a very long time. And I've met people coming out of spiritual practice where there's this incredible rage and grief and loss and sense of betrayal. Anybody in this room gone through that? Raise your hand just to know people. So a quarter or a third of us. And you feel this tremendous emptiness in your heart or like something's wrenched out of you. It's awful. Very deep. And yet you know what that emptiness and that hole and that betrayal is? It's not just the betrayal of that teacher or that group or that system. It's really the wounds that were there all along that we've tried so hard to fill with something outside ourselves. It's that finally we have to come back to ourselves and face ourselves and feel the things that we've tried to fill up with something outside. We have to find our own Buddha nature or discover in these difficulties, what was the lesson that we really needed to learn? So often I'm not so concerned when people have been involved in things, even though it's painful. People talk about what happened with Joya. And I knew two or three houses full of people or dozens of people who went 
she also asked a lot of practice and surrender and they went for a year or three years, however long it was, and stayed up all night meditating and chanting and did incredible practices and learned a lot. And then they were disillusioned at the end, which was probably the best learning of all, mm-hmm. and came out and were a lot wiser. Because what's asked of us is a kind of integrity, a not an idealism. When you mature and you grow up as a child, at first you see your parents as all good or all bad, depending how they are that day. And later on, you can hold that they are complex, that they have all of those parts. And maybe spiritual practice, to put it in another language, is about seeing life with irony and metaphor and complexity And it confuses our mind to see that there's something good and something painful all mixed together, that birth and death come together, that the world isn't just black and white and that there's a perfect teacher and everything else is no good. But that metaphor and irony and complexity and humor and tragedy, tragedy in the Greek sense, that no matter what we do, sometimes we will suffer. And birth and death All of those are confusing to the mind. And if you try to figure it out or create perfection, you can't. But what they can lead you to and what looking at your relationship to teacher or spiritual practice can lead to is a development of the heart, is a greatness of forgiveness and wisdom and a a capacity of the heart to come to rest even though things aren't black and white because they're not black and white. An ability to be at peace and to love and to appreciate, to feel gratitude, even for things that are mixed, which is everything. Some people have come to me and say, I lost my faith. You never lose your faith. You just give it away for a while, but it's yours. You can't lose it. It's like losing your arm or something. You don't lose it. I mean, maybe in an accident, but that's not what I mean. I lost my heart. Well, you give your heart away for a while. But Ajahn Shah used to say, the Dharma is like underground water. Any time that you dig, you'll find it there. It didn't belong to the Buddha. In fact, there never was a Buddha. He was never enlightened. He didn't live in India. It's what's now. This is the Buddha. And sometimes through the disillusionments and the pains and the difficulties, we come not with our mind, our minds can't do it, with our hearts to see the irony, the complexity, the many levels, the metaphor of it, the, the incredible dance of our life. And something else shines. It's like Anne Frank's diaries, even in the midst of all of that suffering, she saw that there was some other reality. There is another reality that's in us. And there's a sacredness and a dignity that we can find. And sometimes it's not until we're really deeply disappointed for a while that we reclaim that in ourselves. I'm going to read you one thing to end. I know I've gone on for a while tonight. From Ram Dass's book, How Can I Help? You walk in the halls of this place and what do you see from room to room? Most people peer in and see this retarded child or that one. They focus on this particular mannerism or that kind of deformity. I do it too. It's very compelling, that picture. But one kid flipped me around on that. We were doing language exercises and for some godforsaken reason, I'd chosen the exchange. How are you? I'm doing fine. We go back and forth. Well, he was having a quite hard time of it slurring. I do if I or some such. Let's try again real slowly. How are you? And he slurred. I do if I. And then suddenly he burst into this wonderful, crazy, slurring laugh. It was the nuttiest sound we'd ever heard, either of us. (laughs) He wasn't doing fine at all. And neither was I. 
We were doing terribly. It was absurd. It was probably absurd to even try to teach him this. And we just began to laugh and howl. In the midst of that, he suddenly gave me this very clear look, the eyes behind the expression. And I had a sudden thought, my God, he knows more than I'll ever know about all this. He sees this whole situation. At which point he just scrunched up his face like a clown and gave me this wonderful wink. And I was just stunned. All I could see was this incredible sense of humor of things. It was so deep in him. He had it all in perspective and he gave that perspective to me. When I left him, my head was put on backwards. I walked down the hall and looked into the other rooms at kids I'd known or I thought I'd known for months. It was all new. I don't quite know how to describe it. In this room, I saw courage. In that room, I saw joy. Across the hall, patience. In yet another room, such sweetness. A little boy who was so continuously filled with love, people would just die in his presence, which is to say they'd come alive. And in the end, after thinking about teachers and gurus and all the mistakes we make, we make mistakes in our love life, in our business life, in our family life, and in our spiritual life. It's kind of part of the package. In the end, it's really pretty simple. It's important to have a practice and to have some way to surrender. And we have to look at it ourselves, our own judgment and integrity of what is bringing us to kindness, to wisdom, to opening. And that the the basis of it is extremely simple. It's just what I read. The basis of it is not what we know or who we know or who is saved or who isn't, but how we meet each day and each person and whether we can see the mystery in it and whether we can love the things that are difficult and complex as well as those that are simple and pure with it, with our heart. I suppose that's all really. And all the rest of it is just a kind of interesting fairy tale or bedtime story about spiritual practice. If you want to know if your spiritual practice is going well, just look at your capacity to love. When we feel bad about ourselves or we feel small or unempowered, when we don't have access to our Buddha nature, then we are prone to see it bigger on someone else. The same way when you fall in love, in a certain way, if there's parts of yourself that you're not in touch with, you see this person and they've got all those things that you want and they are wonderful. And if you could have them, then you'd really be set. Huh. <laughs> In that sense, there's a really deep healing in our spiritual practice of self-acceptance, which is what self-esteem is about, really. And in that healing, then you discover your own Buddha-ness rather than looking for the Buddha someplace else.